So here, as I tilt the iPad, you can see this lovely sort of 3D depth effect, as if the, the light shining down from high above causing a shadow inside our shape. It's a lovely swifty y effect, takes hardly any code to do, and I'll show you exactly how in this video. SwiftUI comes with a whole range of effects we can apply to our views to customize the way they're drawn. And new in iOS 16, we get inner shadows. These create a really interesting illusion, as if our shape or text was kind of cut out with a shadow being cast inside the shape or text, as if there's a sort of light shining down from above uh, and it causing the shadow to appear. That's neat by itself, but if we add in a little bit of core motion, we can read the device's motion being tipped left and right, forwards and backwards, and then move our shadow around as if there really were a light shining down. It looks amazing. It's only a small step further from there. It takes hardly any code, as you'll see. Now, I'm going to walk you through the code. I think you'll be surprised how little work it takes, but please do watch to the end. There are some really important tips you need to know when using this code. Okay, our first step is to make a new observable object that will track core motion's movements. Core motion is separate to SwiftUI, so we'll say first import core motion up here. Bring that whole framework in. And now, before our content view, I'll make our new class an observable object that will track our motion for us. So I'll say down here at a new class called Motion Manager which conforms to the observable object protocol. So SwiftUI views can watch it for changes. Now inside here, it's got to have three properties. One will store an internal property, a CM motion manager, that will do the actual work of core motion tracking movement inside our iPad. So I'll say here, as a private let motion manager equals a new CM motion manager. It's private, not for external use. The remaining two are the X and Y tilt values of our device. This uh, we published, which means that when they change, we'll send out announcements to SwiftUI views saying, hey, please reinvoke your body property. So I'll say there's an app published, var X of 0.0, and app published, var Y of 0.0. Now, in my example code we're building here, we'll make this thing start watching for motion data as soon as a motion manager class is created. This means we'll call start device motion updates inside our initializer. This needs to know where to send the data and also some kind of code to run when new motion data comes in. In our case, we're gonna say deliver these updates to the main queue where our UI work takes place. So we can change Swift UI. Well then, read out our device's attitude, its orientation in space, and apply that to our X and Y properties. So our initializer here, we'll say first motion manager dot start device motion updates to the main queue. And for our handler, we'll say firstly, weak self, don't hold onto myself strongly, given the data and error coming in, and then go ahead and read out the attitude, the orientation of our device. We'll say first, guard let motion is our data attitude, else return. And then our self's x value is motion.roll and our self's y value is motion.pitch. Like that. Copy them across. And that code is not perfect. I'll explain why later on in detail, but for now, that's literally our motion manager class done. We need no more work here. We can move on to SwiftUI code. It publishes data when your motion comes in. Now SwiftUI can read it back out and act on it somehow. Like I said, there's some tips to be aware of, but let's just make it work first. In our content view, I'll use at state object, private var motion, is a new motion manager. Make one of our watchers for the uh, attitude of the device, like this, and keep it alive while our view exists, and also, also watch it for changes. So when a uh, device is tipped, re-invoke the body property, and update our view somehow. Now when it comes to applying a shadow, we can use this effect on images and shapes and other views like text in SwiftUI, and this is all done using a modifier called foreground style. We can say 
uh, add a blue color or a whatever you want to, but then say dot shadow to apply a shadow with an inner or drop effect, giving the color and radius, whatever you need. For example, I'm running an iPad Pro 12.9 inch here, nice big device. So I'll say I want an SF symbol of arrow.down.message.fill. That icon you saw earlier. With a foreground style of dot blue, so a solid blue color. With dot gradient, a very gentle gradient from light blue to slightly darker blue. Again, an iOS 16 plus feature. But then I'll say add a shadow to that. So it's not just a blue gradient, it's a shadowed blue gradient. This is where the new SwiftUI iOS 16 stuff becomes possible. We can ask for an inner shadow right here. And there are various things it takes. We could say there's a radius or a color first and a radius, whatever you want. That kind of code will say, give me an inner shadow that's 10 points wide and a black color. I will also say to my image, you've got a font of system size 600 dot bold. Again, a really, really big device screen. So I want a really, really big icon. And I go ahead and run that code on my iPad Pro again. You will see uh, we get a, a static inner shadow like this one here. And if I grab my iPad, you know, it's not going to respond when I tilt it around. It's just a fixed shadow. We've not done anything with it special. That's fine. It's a nice start. It looks good by itself. But when we add a shadow like this, inner or drop shadow, we can also say, an X and Y offset, how much to move the shadow by. And this is where our motion manager comes in. We have X and Y values being published when they change. So we can basically pass those into our inner shadow offsets to move the shadow around and ideally multiply it by something, a big number, so the effect becomes much more pronounced. And we're on a very, very slow moving shadow, make it more pronounced. So I'll say our inner shadow is still black, Still radius 10, but has an X offset of motion.x times 50 and a Y offset of motion.y times 50. And that's it. That is literally all the code required to get the basic effect. I press Command R again, and we can see when it runs, I will tilt the device to one side or the other side, back and forward. It tilts beautifully, like we've got an actual light shining down from above, which is cool. We can do more, we can do better. This effect, the shadowing effect can be stacked. We can apply more than one shadow if needed. For example, we could add our inner shadow here, but then say on top of that, I want a second shadow using a drop shadow effect. We could say that a drop shadow here, I'll fill in all the values. So color will be dot black dot opacity 0.2. So very, very faint drop shadow with a radius of 10 points still and the same motion value. So motion dot X times 50 and motion dot Y times 50 like that. Otherwise the same values, just take, change it to be a drop with a slightly less color to it. And what this will make is a very interesting sort of embossed effect as a, as a drop shadow and an inner shadow at the same time, as if there's all sorts of indenting going on. You see now I move it around it's like the, 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 is the, the arrow in the middle raised or dropped or a bit of both. It's much more interesting shape we have right now. It's kind of cuts out in an emboss effect. Best of all, this effect applies to other SwiftUI views brilliantly. And we have this image thing being shown here. But we could have said, actually, I want to have a whole V stack of stuff here. And that image is just part of it. And now I'm going to apply all this modifier code here to the whole V stack. I might say, yeah, do the image here, but also do some text. Now I'm currently rendering into a 600 point bold font. So I'll make this quite simple. I'll do like a big question mark, for example. But those modifiers for the shadowing and the gradient, inner and drop, will apply to both things inside there. So when I press Command R again, you're gonna see we get a much more complex effect again, now on the icon, but also in the question mark at the top. Like a little cut out blue gradient question mark, like that with the two shadows applied. It's really, really nice. So that's cool. But before I go into the detailed, boring bit, explaining all the warnings and stuff, there's one more thing you need to know, which is that this is very neat applying into the shadows, 
but there are a whole bunch of other SwiftUI modifiers that benefit from this very much. For example, we could apply a 3D rotation to our VStack. And so rather than saying, just be flat on the screen and change your shadow, actually tilt the whole thing in 3D space based on uh, the device motion. So we could say, after our font, add a rotation 3D effect with dot degrees, and I'll say motion.x times 20. So a lower value, not too much going on here. The axis, I'll say x is zero, y is one, z is zero. Now keep in mind, this is a rotational axis, how we're spinning this thing, not a, a movement axis anymore, not an offset anymore. So it's not quite what you expect. It's kind of flipped around from what you might expect. It's y for x, x for y. That'll do the x stuff. And then I'll also apply another one for the y motion, so it spins in both directions, again times 20. This will use minus one, and then y zero. Before you press run, before you press run, I'd like to make one other small change to simplify our foreground style, because having it spin with a very strong shadow and a very strong drop shadow as well is a bit much. And so I recommend you just trim out the drop shadow, just ditch it entirely, and then just ease off the inner shadow, make it really, really subtle. So you might say 20 and 20. So it's a less of a strong drop shadow. But critically, I would like you also to flip the numbers around. So it's negative 20 here and here to invert the way our shadow takes place. And you'll see why when you press Command R on your own device and try it out. It creates a very, very different effect. So it'll now rotate in 3D space like that, which is cool. But because I flip the shadow around, what we're seeing is when I tilt to the right, the shadow on the right becomes stronger as if I was kind of peering under the white area into the background of space that was previously invisible. So it's a very different effect I'm, I'm kind of getting here. When I light shining down, I'm now peering behind parts of the view with uh, the combination of rotation plus a flipped uh, shadow. It's a lovely effect. It's a simple effect. I hope you use it. It's great fun to work with. Give it a try in your own code. Right, that's the effect. That's all the code, even with the extra modifiers, rotation, and so forth. It's not a lot going on here. Before you start using it, I have some warnings. Now, I hope you've been inspired to use it for a start. That's the main thing. Do use the code. Do inject some joy into your UI. It's great fun. But I have some important tips on what the code's actually doing, because you might have questions or worries about what it's doing. For example, first, um, these two values here, they're both marked published. Publish the X and publish the Y, and you can see that we always change both. Now, when we say at published, we're telling SwiftUI, uh, please reinvoke your body property for any SwiftUI views that are watching this class when one of these published values changes. That's what published does. And we're always changing both. So you might think, wait a minute, it'll reinvoke body here and then re reinvoke body again for changing Y. In practice, that won't happen. In practice, SwiftUI is smart enough to coalesce the two announcements to reinvoke body only once, which is nicer. And so don't worry about having published twice here. It'll be clever enough to coalesce into one single update. Second, we start monitoring for updates of the motion right here on line 17. And you can see if you read documentation for start device motion updates, like over here in Xcode, this thing, you will see using the main operation queue is not recommended. And yet here's Paul Hudson saying, ah, the main queue is fine. Um, so you might think this is a bad idea. I'm giving you terrible code ideas. The problem is if we use any other queue, if we had a local operation queue, for example, doing some other work, we still have to push back to the main queue in order to change these two values somehow. They've got to happen at some point on the main thread in order to update SwiftUI stuff safely. And so ultimately, we've got to push it back to the main thread. So you might say, go to a, a background queue, but then push the main queue inside here. It's the same work. It's no better. Honestly, I wouldn't recommend changing that. So again, it looks like it's wrong code. I think it's fine. The reason it says don't use the main queue is explained just before that. It does say the, the events might arrive at a high rate because you're tilting constantly. So it's throwing events out really, really fast, like a fire hose. And we're telling SwiftUI to reinvoke body again, and again, and again, and again, a lot of times per second. And so it's making a lot of work isn't necessary. That's why it says don't use main. A better idea, given that we kind of have to use main at some point here, is to actually limit 
the rate we read the motion. And we can do that by going into our code and saying our motion manager dot device motion update interval. How fast update? And if we'd said here one, it means read the motion once a second. It'll be jerky as heck. You don't want that. We're going to say one divided by 15. So one fifteenth of a second, which honestly, even on a big screen with a massive font like this is enough. It looks smooth enough. It's not, you know, 60 FPS anymore, but it's close enough. You can see it tilting around. It is a pretty good job of being smooth, even at 15 frames a second, while also not maxing out a whole CPU core, just doing redraws of the screen with various shadows. Give it a try. If you find 1 15th too slow, try 1 20th or even 1 30th. I wouldn't recommend going above that. I certainly wouldn't recommend doing nothing at all. Pick an update interval that's less than the default, less than fire hose, ideally as low as you can. Keep in mind, that's a 600 point bold font. If you work with very small icons or very small text, honestly, a tenth of a second is probably enough. And our 15th here. Anyway, third, inside our call to start device motion updates, I immediately say weak self. Do not allow this closure to hold firmly onto my motion manager, otherwise you have a retain cycle happening where the motion manager here owns a CM motion manager and the CM motion manager owns a motion manager. Don't do that. You'll end up with this problem where your app is reading updates forever and ever and ever, even after the class is supposed to be destroyed. Uh, so don't do that. Weak self avoids that problem. It will automatically, when our view is dismissed, if you hide the view, for example, it'll destroy the state object, which will destroy the motion manager, which will stop reading device updates, which is fine. If you intend to use the effect in multiple places, multiple views using it, multiple different screens or icons, who knows what, multiple places having the same motion manager, please, please do not create multiple motion manager instances. Don't have one of these in every one of your views, right? Make it once and share it across your application. That's how it's designed to work, to avoid problems. Make it once, put it into the environment if you want to, share it like that, and they'll all use it from that same shared pot of motion data. If you do take the approach, I'd recommend you take this whole start device motion updates call out into a separate start method. So you can say, now start reading. And then add a counterpart stop method that will call stop device motion updates when you no longer need the information. You can start and stop freely as needed as your application runs smoothly. And to really unlock where you want to be, ideally you actually have like an active count property inside your motion manager, tracking how many views want to have motion. So it goes down to zero again, when the final view said, okay, I can stop now, it's fine, I disappeared, stop. Um, it can say, okay, I can stop tracking motion until the next view says, please start again. So it activates and deactivates correctly automatically for us. Finally, final tip for you here, I have not taken into account my little sandbox code here, any kind of device orientation. My iPad is in portrait mode only. If you intend to ship this code for real and your app supports rotation, make sure you take that into account to adjust your shadows and your, your pitch and roll X and Y appropriately. Whew. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed the video. I hope you've learned something new. I hope you're keen to go forth and add inner shadows to your SwiftUI iOS 16 plus apps, perhaps even add some core motion. Again, having some joy in app design once again. If you do make something with this, please tweet me on Twitter. I am two straws on Twitter. I'd love to see your project. Send me a little video of what you made with it. I'd love to see it. And if you enjoyed the video, like, subscribe, leave a comment, all that kind of jazz. I really appreciate it. Take care, folks.